Welcome to another episode of Hidden Stories Healed Now. Today, we're going to talk about something that happens a lot within the black community. And it's something that I can identify with in more ways than one. We have a phenomenal guest with us today, Ms. Adana Gary. And she's going to share her story. And we're going to talk about color in the black community. Welcome, Adana. Thank you, Vicki, Thank for you having me. Thank you so much for being here. And I appreciate your willingness to share your journey as it relates to color. So would you please share with our audience the things that you've experienced? Sure. So um, I experienced um, something that really marked me since I was a child. And I didn't actually even realize how impactful it was until I was an adult. So um, I come from a pretty large family. Uh, everybody is very supportive of one another, a huge extended family. We get together often, um, but there was always a side of my family I didn't always go and visit, and I never really understood why. I, didn't, I just kind of accepted it, you know, it just was what it was. Um, and when I was probably about six or seven, I had gone to a trip um, to visit that side of my family and was in the room with one of my elders and was playing and, you know, just being a kid. And the reason that this sticks out to me is because she asked me to come to her. And I said, sure. So I went over to her and she said to me, so baby, you have to make sure that you pay attention to everything you do because you're too dark, you're darker than this paper bag. So she actually had a brown paper bag from the grocery store and she held it up to me. At seven, you know, I, I was like, yes ma'am, kind of kept it moving. It really didn't even cross my mind that it was wrong or a problem. Um, just because I think that the conversation was so out of the blue that I didn't connect all the dots. Um, I went on about my business, played, and you know, um, was with my cousins and enjoyed myself and went back home and I mentioned it to my mother. Um, and she is, or was very light. And I explained to her that, hey, I was in the room and this is what was said with me and, I, and her whole entire face got red. And I had never seen my mother that angry. Like, you know, you know when your mama mean business, mm -hmm. when she's like, girl, I done told you to sit down, right? She was past that, girl, mm -hmm. I done told you to sit down. And I thought originally, I'm like, mom, you know, mommy, I didn't do anything. And she was like, no, it's not you, it's not your fault. And she just started crying and it made me cry. And she explained to me what was happening. And I thought, but this is the way that God made me. And she said, you're beautiful. She just kept saying, but you're beautiful, you're beautiful. And I remember that I kept thinking, but this is how God made me. So how can that be wrong? And she just kept telling me, you're beautiful, you're beautiful. I went on about my business, you know, didn't, it didn't come back up again in, in following days. Um, I since learned that she had a conversation with that relative. It did not go well, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I was not part of that conversation <laughs> as I should not have been. Mm -hmm. um, but I did not go back to engage with those relatives because she would not let me go unless she was with me. Um, and as I grew up, I would always get comments about how dark I was and, um, you know, that you're, you're gonna, you know, you'll be really pretty if you keep your hair long or, um, you know, you have really nice teeth for a dark girl. And these weren't, you know, white people telling that, these were black people that were saying this to me. And then, you know, I'm thinking, uh, okay, well, is something wrong that I, can't be just pretty the way I am. So I became hyper fixated on how I looked, right? So then at that point, I'm in school. I'm 
trying out for cheerleading. I was commented by another um, sister that, well, you know there can only be two of us on the squad and you're too dark. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up pulling out of trying out because I was like, okay, you know, I, 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 I don't even want to fight this battle. Um, I was often in class and I sometimes would be, a lot of times I would be the only black person in the class. I grew up in a relatively small town in Tennessee um, and the other black students, they would always comment about my looks. So it was never just, oh, you're the smart girl, but you're the smart dark girl, right? You can't be cute. You're not pretty enough because I was dark. It was always tied to my skin color. Never just um, that I could represent, but it was because I was darker and they, I think, saw some of themselves in me and didn't want to be in the position that I was in. And so they wanted to try to put some of their dislikes off on me. And I received it, right? I, I took it in. Um, and again, continued to live my life, do my things, you know, grew up, got out of high school, went to college, got a degree, et cetera. Um, and one day I was with one of my mentors who happens to be a black female. She is much lighter than me. And she actually had a women's circle. In that circle, one of the things that they asked us to do was to talk about something that framed our being. And I kept thinking, I don't really know what I'm gonna say. I don't know what to do. And I went into her bedroom and I said, Lord, I know that there's something that you want me to get rid of. I don't know what it is, but I feel like that I can't be everything you want me to be because something is holding me back. And I couldn't come up with anything. I went out to the circle. Everybody was saying their little things and then it got to me and I blurted out that I don't think I'm beautiful because I'm black. It just came out my mouth. And I was like, and I immediately started to cry. And then all of those incidents just came flooding back. And I remember thinking to myself, now, Lord, is this what you had to give me? Like, you couldn't give me nothing else. <laughs> and he was like, but I need you to feel this so that you will always remember that I made you, not them. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay. Because even as a kid, right, growing up with all of those instances, I was always looking for approval from someone else. And I was always running to whoever the black girl in the classroom was, the black boy or whomever. And then, you know, sometimes they were with me and sometimes they weren't. And some of it, you know, was me attributing to them what had happened to me. But I didn't even understand any of that, right? So in that moment, I realized that that was part of my journey to be able to carry forward to other girls and other women that what you are is what God made you. And that, that sunshine that you have is for you, not for others to give to you. It's what he has given to you. And it doesn't matter if you are the darkest crayon in the box or the lightest crayon in the box. He made the whole box and they all work together to create that picture. So take it upon yourself to draw your part because your part is always gonna be beautiful. So I always try to carry that message with me. Um, you know, just multiple times having to relive what that meant to me. And now that I have children, there's a lot of lessons that I try to pass on to them because both of my children are very dark skinned as well. Um, and so I always want to be able to instill in them a love for themselves 
But I realized that without having had those experiences, that honestly, I probably never would have had the love for myself that I have, which is kind of crazy because you're like, really? So you beat yourself up so you can love yourself more? But that's how it works, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> A lot of times, that's how we are able to learn those lessons because God already knows we're hard headed. He knows that we're not ready for the plain truth. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes he's going to allow us, you know, and me, Adana, to go through those types of things to make it plain. So then therefore I can carry it forward and help someone else. Wow. So I can relate to this story on the other end. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it's something that, that we can talk about um, after we come back from a station break. Um, we're gonna take a station break, we'll be right back. Every story has a hidden element that is not often shared. Hidden Stories, Healed Now with host Vicki Wright Hamilton seeks to share the hidden gems in real life experiences. Our guests are ordinary people sharing their stories of overcoming insurmountable odds while providing hope and inspiration. Thank you so much for joining back in on Hidden Stories Healed Now. We're gonna to continue to talk about our episode regarding color in the black community. So, you know, Adana first, <clears throat> let me start by saying, you are one beautiful <laughs> black woman. Thank you. From head to toe, hair, skin, body, and all. And I am so glad that you're not letting anyone else define who you are. Um, and so as we continue to talk about um, what happens in the community, and now you have children and, and you're moving into, you know, as, as an adult, um, what are some of the adult things that you have had to deal with, whether it's been at work, whether it's mm -hmm. been through community, it's been at home, and how did you deal with them? Yeah. So um, having gone through that as a child, um, I now kind of keep that in the back of my mind to kind of spur me every day to remind myself of the fact that I am beautiful, right? Because having had that experience, it's gonna always be with me. I can't get rid of it, but I can transform it. Um, and interestingly enough, you know, working in corporate America, I find a lot of times that, you know, folks mean no harm, but um, I will get a lot of comments um, about my color in relation to how I behave, right? And so, um, I have a best friend who she's much lighter than me. She has green eyes. She is way more aggressive than I am when she gets upset. It takes her a long time to get there. But when she's there, like it's, it's, it's on, right? I am much more direct, but it'll take me a while before I go completely off the edge. Um, and, you know, we, we've worked together before. Um, and there have been times where in that scenario, not specifically with her, but in that scenario where I have been told, you know, well, you know, again, and this is by black executives telling me, well, you really shouldn't be that assertive or aggressive when you're in the room. And I'm thinking, what are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, the other sister who was here, she went all the way off, okay? <laughs> and I just said a few little things, but you're talking to me. Well, you know, you look like you were a little more angry. What? So where does that come from? I don't understand. Of course, again, I'm going to ask the question, and their response is always, well, I, I didn't really mean it like that. No, you meant it like that. So let's talk about that because I need you to see me. I need you to also understand as you see me that you cannot attribute what you believe and the story you have written for me onto me. You have to receive only what I give you. And therefore that means that you have to allow me the space to be as black or as Latina or as white or as whatever I am, right? Because I am Madonna. 
So receive me how I am. But when I walk into a room, in particular, if I am the only um, female and there and a lot of times there are black men in the room, they're telling me, well, make sure that you're you know, you don't get too loud. You don't get too aggressive. You don't get too because they're attributing right already the angry black woman and the fact that I'm darker. That makes it worse in their eyes. Um, and so I typically have to have conversations to let folks know that I will not accept that behavior because I am not having this conversation just for me. I'm having this conversation for every black female that ever crosses this door. I'm also having this conversation for you as a black male, because while quiet as is kept, you can say whatever you want to me, you trying to be my brother, giving me information or even my sister. But when we're also then with our white colleagues, oh, they're saying worse. So we need to figure this out together. Um, you know, I recently had an incident where a leader told me um, that, well, you're really, your hair is so beautiful for a black woman. <laughs> and I was like, well, so hair is not just pretty, period. I could be bald, would I still be pretty? And he was like, well, oh, sure, of course, of course. But, you know, you're so dark and your skin is so nice. And I was like, OK. I said, well, this conversation is going to go bad. Mm -hmm. So it's OK. We don't have to talk about this anymore. I think what you were trying to say was that you really thought that I was a beautiful woman. You could have stopped there. That's perfectly fine. We don't have to go further than that. Um, so. I get comments like that all the time. And what I try to do is just be mindful of A, they're human, and B, that a lot of times we don't have those conversations because we're afraid of the reaction of the other person. And we're also afraid of our own reaction, right? Because we already know that within our community, that is a, a huge hurt that all of us experience on all levels, in all colors, on all continents. And so having that conversation brings up a lot of soul stirring pain that we don't necessarily want to deal with and delve into. And so we will ignore it. We'll kind of let it slide. But I feel like that part of my job and what I'm called to do is bring attention to it. I don't, I try not to attribute it to that the person is being malicious. I just want to let you know that I really heard what you said. Mm -hmm. And I want you to consider what you're saying and then reframe that conversation. Take out dark or black and then have the conversation. Mm -hmm. Do you have the same conversation? Does me being dark or black change what you were going to say? If it doesn't, you can leave it out. If it is important and credible, then let's talk about what that means, right? Mm -hmm. But I want people to have the conversation. Mm -hmm. I don't want to shut it down mm -hmm. because those are things that, again, are part of our soul makeup. And because we don't have those conversations, we carry it on, we send it to our children without meaning to, right? Because I have two small kids uh, 13 and seven, a, a boy and a girl. And I, when I first had my daughter, she's the youngest, I had to stop myself from talking about how pretty she was as a dark skinned girl. Cause I always be like, oh, her skin is so pretty. And in my head, I, I'm, I didn't necessarily say it all the time, but in my head, I'm thinking for a dark girl. Um, and, and that's from someone who went through it, right? And I had to reframe that conversation to talk about the beauty that she has, whether it's skin or soul, right? Mm -hmm. So now when I talk to her, I talk about how chocolate she is, but I say, you know, chocolate is beautiful in all shades, whether it's white chocolate or dark chocolate. Don't you like all of those chocolates? She's like, yeah, mommy. I'm like, there you go. I said, but you got your own unique chocolate and I think it's just beautiful. 
I will eat chocolate any day of the week. Snickers, you and Reese's, you and M &Ms, too, okay? whatever you got. It's all, it's all about that chocolate. Whether it's dark chocolate, milk chocolate, it doesn't matter. That's chocolate right. rules. Well, we're going to take a station break. And when we come back, um, I want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, that spectrum um, and, and share some experiences, you know, and get your insights, you know, um, from myself as well. Um, and get your insights about uh, as we continue this conversation and make it go forward. And then see if we have an audience member who would like to ask a question or give a tip or have a comment. We'll be right back. Every story has a hidden element that is not often shared. Hidden Stories, Healed Now with host Vicki Wright Hamilton seeks to share the hidden gems in real life experiences. Our guests are ordinary people sharing their stories of overcoming insurmountable odds while providing hope and inspiration. So welcome back to Hidden Stories Healed Now. So, you know, when we were talking about um, the spectrum, so I'm on the other end. Mm -hmm. um, I was never dark enough to be black and I was too dark to be white. Mm -hmm. And every place I sat, I was the token. You know, it's like, oh, you're only there because you're the closest one that looks like them. Mm -hmm. You know, you're their token. I couldn't be smart. I couldn't deserve it. I couldn't have earned it. You mm -hmm. know, so I was always on that other, that other spectrum. Mm -hmm. And I remember my mother telling me, you know, my mother was very fair. And um, my mother had to fight you know, in terms of always proving she was black. Now, you mm -hmm. knew she was black when she opened her mouth, mm -hmm. okay? You had to worry about whether she was black or not or where she came from. You knew she was black. Right. Um, and, um, and everything that she stood for through her activism and, uh, and all the things she did in civil rights. But she always said to me, I said, Mama, why? Why does this start? And she said, think about it. It started back from slavery days. Mm -hmm. We had enough people that were in the field, only a certain number could go to the house. Mm -hmm. So the ones that went to the house were the ones that were like, oh, you get the extra treatment yep. and, and you get to look different. You're not out here in the sun getting mm -hmm. dark with mm -hmm. the rest of us. And then it was like, there's not enough room for all of us in mm -hmm. the house. We can only have a few. Mm -hmm. And then it was about the special treatment of what happened in the house versus the field. Mm -hmm. And she said, so our minds were programmed. Yes from generation to generation to generation to generation, mm -hmm. that is what's causing us to not be able to necessarily let that go. Because even today, it's every black is trying to fight for what mm -hmm. they want, every Asian, every, I mean, all the people of color yep. are trying to fight for their equity and their positions mm -hmm. and, and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. That it's like, okay, I gotta get mine. And, and there's not enough room for you and me. Right. Yes. So even that support system, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So I would love to get your perspective um, in terms of that beginning and and where that started. Mm -hmm. And especially with talking to your children, mm -hmm. how are you changing that paradigm mm -hmm. from history? Mm -hmm. Because they're going to get older and as they get older, they'll be learning about what happened mm -hmm. in history. Mm -hmm. What are your thought processes as a parent? So. Uh, good question. Um, in terms of what I talk to my children about directly, so because they're so young, especially the seven-year-old, right, I don't get too deep into history right. with her, right. but my son I do. So, you know, I have, we, I have shared with him about Sarah Barton. Um, I have shared with him about how gynecology started because those women were darker skinned women because they were attributed to being more animal like because they were closer to the shade and the coloring of what, you know, monkeys, gorillas. So for whites, they wanted to use that mind psychology to show us, hey, this is how close you are. I'm gonna treat you exactly how I would treat a monkey or an animal, et cetera. And we, again, to your point, right, we have carried that on because of wanting to get better treatment. So we want to be seen favorably by the power structure. Um, but when I talk to them, I talk to them from a human perspective. And I always say to them, when you are in your best, when you think that you are at the top of your game, 
Are you looking to bring people with you? And are you that concerned about what color they are when you bring them? And because my son is very em empathic, he always is a very village person. Um, and so he's like, you know, well, mom, I don't understand what you're saying. And I said, OK, so if you have 40 million dollars and you want to be able to leave that 40 million dollars, how are you going to make that selection to anybody? Right. It doesn't matter whether it's family or friends or whomever. What is the first thing that you think about when you want to give that 40 million dollars? And he said, well, you know, I obviously want them to do something good with it or I want to be able to help them. And I said, OK, so do you ever consider that if the money goes to someone that is dark? In the African di diaspora that you're not going to give it to them or light in the African diaspora, are you not going to give it to them? He's like, no. I said, are you sure about that? Because when you're actually when you have that kind of power, you have decisions that you don't even understand you have that you can make. And he said, but with that kind of power, I need to have responsibility that I want to care for people and not for myself. And I said, there you go. When you stop caring about yourself and how you look in the situation and you really care about people, then you won't be concerned about is dark or light or whatever, because now you've broken it down into these are human beings and I want to engage with them. For my daughter, who's seven, right, that's a little different. So she's in the stage now where, um, you know, she's noticing all the things, right? She has a wider nose, she has curly hair, she's darker skin, you know, all this. Um, so for her, I just try to surround her with everything under the diaspora I can think of. So we have a book that talks about all the different chocolate babies and it goes from white chocolate all the way to Oreo. <laughs> and, and there's actually, it's like a little ABC book. I had it with my son, I have it with her. We literally read that book almost every night because I want her to see the beauty in being onyx versus being a white tiger, right? that they all make up. But I have to continue to reinforce that to her because when she goes out into the world, she's going to get different messages. But I always fall back on the fact that at seven, I remember that lesson about the brown paper bag. Mm -hmm. So at seven, I hope, her, hope she will remember this lesson that I'm giving her by reading her this simple ABC story that talks about all the beautiful black children and gives each one of them a beautiful name for whatever shade they are. Well, I have to tell you, um, I really appreciate you sharing that with the audience to give them some insights and some conversations that they could potentially have with their children. Um, because I think it's so important we talk about this and give advice and helpful tips to help others um, as they're struggling because they may not know what to do. So I really appreciate those insights. That's, that's great information. Let's see if we have a question from our audience. Hi, I do have a question. Uh, my name is Dr. Sean Therese. Um, I'm an educator by profession and I really appreciate uh, this conversation because um, these are some of the questions that I deal with with my students all the time mm -hmm. and coming from um, a very fair-skinned mother and a very dark-skinned father these are definitely questions that I grew up hearing so my question for you is this what kind of advice do you think uh, you could give to those of us in the black diaspora who are still color struck because mm -hmm. it is 2021 mm -hmm. And it, all you have to do is look at social media, look at media in general. This is still an issue. Mm -hmm. So what do we need to do um, in order to get past this, mm -hmm. um, this issue, this challenge that we still have with colorism? Thank you for the question. Um, I don't know that I have an answer to get past it, but what I will say is this. The first thing we have to do is have the conversation. That's where we have to start. Um, we will 
get so riled up about having the conversation, right? Because we will um, want to take a side. Everybody has something to say, but we're not necessarily having a conversation about it. We want to prove that each side has experienced colorism. Uh, OK, we we got that. Let's move on past that. Now let's talk about what is the actual goal that colorism did to us when it came into our community, right? So having the conversation to start at the genesis, understand what was it, what, why did it even come into our community, helps us to understand we're all starting from the same place. They didn't do this just because they thought it would be fun. This was beneficial. So if you can divide and conquer, right? A house divided is always gonna fall. For us to understand that and then have the conversation with each other, also considering that we have to maintain that village mentality. We have to recognize we're part of the same village. That's how we grew up. That's how our ancestors were. That's how our families were. Now we might, we might be a little disparate in where we live, but you know you always gonna call your cousin. You always gonna <laughs> call your homegirl, your homeboy that you grew up with. You gonna remember them, right? And if you consider the fact that in that village, we were so protective of one another, right? Even when you're talking about your siblings. So you could dog your sibling out all day, but the first time somebody said something about your sibling, oh no, no ma'am, no <laughs> sir, it was about to be a whole thing. We have to treat each other the same way and understand that we are about a village and we have to see each other as a part of that village. And what we all experience is the same thing. And what do we wanna get out of having those conversations. So let's just have the conversation. Let's start. It's not me against you and you against me. We're not trying to outdo each other. Let's talk about now, okay, where do we want to go? How do we want to operate within our beautiful chocolate diaspora? Well, you know, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and I believe that conversation starts with a lot of things, but we have to be honest and open mm -hmm. and willing to share. Yes. Again, what this episode is really all about. Will you all join me in thanking Adana Garrett for being with us today? Thank you. Thank you so much for joining in for an episode of Hidden Stories Healed Now. Um, remember, for every hidden story that comes out, for everything that we keep in the closet and we bring out is the freedom that we bring to each other. See you next time.